for many in this room and beyond. This moment has been eagerly awaited. One man penned words on paper six years ago, unwittingly but profoundly altering the lives of many, including tens of thousands of Hungarians. These people rightfully deserve these words. Mr. Jambenda, welcome to Hungary. Well, good morning. First up, I should say, uh, well, I think we could all thank Balaj and the organizing committee for your leadership in bringing us all together today. Um, what an impressive gathering. Uh, what an impressive amount of support for something which uh, is not an easy topic, particularly in professional settings. Um, yeah, so it's amazing to be here. Thank you very much. Did you hear that, or shall I start again? <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, in a way, me being here in front of you today is deeply strange. Um, because I'm here because of failure. Uh, my failure. And the failure of the profession and the social movement I was part of for over two decades. Um, and I'm here because I admitted that failure publicly. That profession, that social movement, was uh, environmental sustainability. It was my passion, it was my life, it was my meaning of life. Um, and so, looking in 2017 at the latest climatology, and also the latest data on, on that, was deeply troubling to me. And so the paper I wrote, Deep Adaptation, was in part uh, a kind of a scream or a howl um, about what I was discovering. And in that, I think a desire to connect and to talk about it with other people. But another part of it was I wanted to force myself to leave my profession to leave the security of my job, to leave the security of the status of an academic position, environment. I didn't trust myself that I wouldn't fall back into denial. So I thought, I'll put this paper out there, this uncompromising paper, deep adaptation about my conclusions, and it will burn my bridges with my profession, and I'll have to move on. But what I didn't realize was what would happen if it went viral. And so it did go viral, and over a million downloads within about 18 months. And people were turning to me to ask me what to do about it. From all walks of life, from all parts of the globe, I mean, it was to do with personal issues, about should I have children, professional issues, should I stay in my job, all sorts. And faced with that, I thought, well, I just want to get them talking to each other. <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> I thought I was only writing this for my corporate sustainability profession. So that's what then help the movement come about. Um, yeah, and so I got people and talked to each other and then the deep adaptation movement began. Um, so the paper helped people come together on a new basis to courageously and creatively explore how to live with this very difficult outlook on the future. So clearly, it unlocked something. There was a latent need for people to talk about this. And the paper gave a bit of impetus th to that and a framework for that and a set of questions to get you started. Um, and I've been amazed at how people have been, um, have been working from that basis. Um, but I think looking back at that, there's a lesson in there. Um, and it's a reminder of what can happen that's positive, that comes about because of adversity. 
comes out that comes about because of setbacks, comes out comes about because of, of suffering. Um, and we have continual reminders of that. So our experience with COVID-19 is a, a recent example of that. You know, the disease was unwelcome, is unwelcome. Some of the policy responses are unwelcome. But there's another side to it. In my own personal life, my parents were divorced for 25 years, but with the lockdown, they bubbled together, and became friends again, and then remarried. <laughs> In my own little world, the experience of lockdowns and actually getting the disease, both, both of them, led to um, a new musicality. Um, and I was thinking about that just recently because that's very alive for me at the moment because last week my uh, newest single came out as a, as a music video. It's called Healing Hearts, by the way. Healing, if you... It's on Spotify and YouTube and everywhere, and check it out. <laughs> I'm still sort of trying to change career, as, as you can see. Um, but, yeah, that came about because of adversity. So it was July 2021. I was living in Bali. And um, I, was, I went on holiday with some friends to a, an, an island just off the coast of Bali called Limbongan. And July 21 in Indonesia, there was a new wave. And suddenly, there was a new level of lockdown announced where people couldn't travel between the islands. And, and they were enforcing it. So we looked on our WhatsApp groups of our friends and there were pictures of the army on the streets in the port town we'd left from. So we decided to stay put on a small tropical island. You know, we didn't have it too bad in our lockdown. Um, but the thing was, I'd, brought, I'd just started playing guitar and I had my guitar with me. I knew one song all the way through and I was really proud of that. So at sunset there I was playing my song. And Luciana, my Brazilian friend, said, wow, would you like to be in my cacao ceremony band tomorrow morning? And she said, oh, the songs are really easy, only four or five, and you can learn them like this. Um, now, I'd never, you know, that was only one song I'd, I'd learned, and I'd never played in front of a group of people as part of a music band. But we were in the middle of a um, medical apocalypse on a tropical island. Um, and it seemed like the best thing to do with my time. And um, so, yeah, that adversity. I was probably the only guitarist on the island, so I mean, she didn't have anyone else to ask. But the, uh, that, that night, I practiced into the night. I stopped when I thought my fingers are getting really sore and I don't want to have blisters tomorrow morning on this, during the ceremony. So I, I played the next day, and I was so focused on everything and getting it right that I'd even forgotten there was an audience. So when the audience members came up to me afterwards and said, wow, that was amazing, thank you, you really opened my heart, it was like, oh, wow, <laughs> wow. I can, I can actually help people have joyous, sacred experiences together. And that created a whole new sense of wonder of this thing of being alive. Me, you know, at the age of 50, can somehow suddenly start playing music. And I started writing songs, and within a couple of months, I was playing some of my songs at these cacao ceremonies. So I wanted to tell you that story because although we don't wish adversity on each other, we all know that something positive can come from adversity. And just as we don't wish suffering on each other, we all know that we can change because of it, and in ways that we come to value. And that's what I've been discovering personally and collectively over these last five years of the deep adaptation movement. That term deep adaptation describes the idea that we can respond to the breakdown of our society in meaningful ways, to help soften the crash, plant the seeds of something new, and to learn from the process. For people with such a perspective, the pain of realizing our planetary predicament doesn't go away, but it's supplemented by a joy, a joy of connection and of personal transformation. So what is key for that supplementary benefit is to allow 
allow our perception of our situation to enter our consciousness more often and enter our conversations more often with each other so we can begin to integrate it into our lives and work out together how to live from now on. Um, I wouldn't mind a glass of water, actually, if someone could get me one. Thank you. Um, I think there might be water in, in the, through, through there. Um, behind the curtains, yeah, thanks. Um, here in Hungary, I think that's happening more than anywhere else in the world. And that's not because societal collapse is more progressed here than elsewhere. It certainly is not. Um, I'm super impressed with Budapest, by the way. Um, it seems to be because culturally here in Hungary, the elites and the managerial class aren't so allergic to the idea that society as we know it might be breaking. That means it's been regarded as a credible opinion to have, and therefore it's been platformed in mainstream media as something worthy of discussion. So that means citizens in Hungary have been hearing from smart, concerned, and dynamic people working on all kinds of adaptation, including deep adaptation. So that profile and dialogue has encouraged a range of activity, a dynamic range of activity here in Hungary at local levels. That's not relying on or waiting for national government to act. It's just people deciding to get on with what they believe to be true in their own lives and in their own communities. But in many other countries, most other countries, the topic of societal collapse remains taboo within mainstream media. Therefore, the truth of our predicament is only squeezing out into the mainstream through art and through music. And that's because creativity comes from reflection on reality and can only resonate with us if it's touching something of a truth of our own experience. I know there's a, a Hungarian poet called Attila Joseph. I don't know if I pronounced that properly. I probably didn't. But um, thank you very much. Um, he said, the poet never lies. He's either truthful or he dies. And many people are leading lives they consider to be more creative, perhaps more poetic, directly as a result of facing the truth of unfolding societal breakdown and ultimately collapse. And that's certainly my story. And I'm happy about it, even if people don't like my music. <laughs> I took years to integrate this perspective. Um, some people don't. Um, looking back on the Deep Adaptation Forum, um, uh, now five years after we launched it, the first coordinator after me, Zori Tomova, I was thinking back to when I first talked to her about this. It was after an improvisational theatre class, and we went to dinner, a group of us, and as what normally happens, the question, what do you do? And I had just finished writing the Deep Adaptation paper, and I thought, this is going to be a bit awkward. Um, so I decided, okay, I'll tell her. I'll tell her that I am a researcher, that I've taken a year off university because I was so scared of what's happening with the climate, and I've gone back to the primary climate science, looking at it for myself, and I've concluded that there is enough self-reinforcing, self-amplifying feedbacks to mean that we're no longer in control, that we are having rapid, possibly abrupt climate change, and it's going to have catastrophic effects on society in our lifetimes. What's for dessert? Um, so she, like quite a lot of people, because she was an environmentalist and she was going to go back to Bul Bulgaria and launch her recycling business, that was her sense of what she would be doing. But she said, yeah, that kind of makes sense to me. Um, I must read your paper. So how long have we got? And I said, well, I don't know, in highly complex systems, it's impossible to say. And who's the we? You know, where in the world? Um, but I'm living my life now as if I've only got 10 years more before my life is very different, where society will be breaking around me and where I'll be more focused on survival. That's how I felt at the time. That was five years ago. Um, and she within 24 hours, read the paper, checked some of the references, and decided that it was her truth, 
and she dropped her ideas of what she wanted to do and she instead thought, okay, if I've only got 10 years left to be able to do whatever I want to do in the world, what do I believe in? And she believed in connecting people in the spirit of play and love and to connect with each other and with nature and the divine. And then she, she became a facilitator, a life coach, con launched the Connection Playground, ended up moving to Guatemala, learning from shaman, and then becoming a shaman herself, and now recently getting into music. So doing completely different things as a direct result of this information. Who knows whether it would have been better for the world and her if she'd gone back to Bulgaria and started her uh, recycling startup. But I think it's very interesting to see how massive personal transformations uh, that come from the heart are possible when people um, allow themselves to accept the, how, how, how difficult things are now for, for humanity. I'm actually, I mean, people respond in other ways. So some people go full-time in Extinction Rebellion as activists. Some people become community leaders. Some people start uh, permaculture farms and farm schools, myself included. Um, I've decided we should actually be proud of the transformations we undergo. And I've, in my new book, I call ourselves doomsters. So not gloomy doomers, doomsters. So that uh, comes from the idea of sort of being masters of doom, um, socially engaged masters of doom, people who decide that we don't want to be victims or apathetic, we're actually going to allow this to change us and we're going to try and be our best selves as more and more difficulties unfold. Now, if you're not on board with this outlook on society, then I understand, because it did take me years to look into the scholarship on it, accept it, and then years to change my life as a result of that. And the issue is so big and so life-changing, of course you're going to need to do your own reading, your own cross-checking, uh, and I'm not going to be able to convince you now, so I won't try. But I will mention a few things which I invite you to keep in mind, uh, and perhaps if you're not convinced, that will help you, uh, it'll help you decide today to look further at this, rather than think this is all a bit strange, extreme, gloomy. The Human Development Index. Uh, I used to work at the UN. The Human Development Index, I think, was launched in 1992. It's considered uh, the, the, the best analysis of the level of standard, standard of living in, in societies around the globe. It's de been declining each year since 2019 in 80% of countries in all regions of the world. And some of that data is collected two years before release, so it's a decline that began pre-pandemic Previously, it had been rising always in richer countries since 1990. So it was 1990 it started then. Also, the, uh, I talk about uh, the data on the quality of life in, in the world uh, from Numbio. That's also in chapter one of my book, Breaking Together. And it shows a global plateauing of quality of life in 90% of countries since 2016. 90% um, now have a declining quality of life in the last few years. And that includes rich OECD countries um, that uh, have been, the fall has been consistent since 2016. And remember, also some of that data was collected a few years prior, so prior to 2015. So yes, deep adaptation is inviting us to ditch sustainability and sustainable development as our paradigm. It is saying that that is based on a failed ideology, things are going backwards, and they have been almost for 10 years. In fact, when people were signing off on those sustainable development goals in New York, when the leaders, the majority of their societies had already begun their persistent decline. In my book, Breaking Together, I'm connecting these cracks on the surface of modern societies to crumbling foundations in the economic, monetary, and energy, environmental, and food systems. And of course, climate change is an accelerator of all those fractures. It impacts on, on food systems, for example. Um, and of course, it's a terrible problem uh, in and of itself um, through natural disasters. Specific societies have been disrupted terribly for centuries, uh, both by natural disasters and political violence. But the evidence I present in Breaking Together supports the view that we've reached a point where most modern societies, while continuing to function okay on the surface, particularly if you're middle class or above, um, and you can buy yourself out of the, the, the difficulties, 
Um, despite that, they are in their early stages of collapse. I believe that because I've looked at technology and I realize that it will not save us. Um, we're going to hear more probably about energy from, from Simon later, um, Simon Michaud, but um, I talk about it in a chapter on energy collapse in, in the book. Um, the problem is with battery technology. I mean, the, uh, the amount of, of metals we need uh, for the amount of batteries we need, you know, and where the metals are, how long it's going to... There's not enough of them, and it's going to take too long to get them out of the ground. Um, one report from the International Energy Agency calculated we're going to need to increase um, mining of these uh, critical minerals and rare, min rare earth minerals from 400 to 4,000%. Um, and that's, that's assuming we can replace 80% of primary energy generation. That's over 80%, which comes from fossil fuels at the moment. Um, other people have highlighted how those minerals and metals are in some of the most pristine wilderness areas on the planet. And so we will be trashing the planet in order to sustain the idea that we can somehow continue our lifestyles and just uh, electrify the economy and we can all drive electric vehicles and stop worrying. So that is quite an ironic tragedy that is now beginning to happen. We've also got a problem with fertilizers, which require um, fossil natural gas. The grain monocultures are what our civilization depends on. I think 80% of calories that humanity eats are from a, a handful of basic grains. Either we eat them directly or the livestock we feed them to. Um, I believe in organic farming. I, I now co-own an organic farm in Indonesia in a farm school, and it's really important. But I do that to help soften the crash. It won't stop the crash. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we need to just be honest about, about the, the terrifying situation we're in. The reality is we are a hydrocarbon civilization and we must power down. And to do that, the rich must go first and they won't choose to. It's not going to happen because we live in the tyranny of an expansionist monetary system where incumbent power is entrenched in our economic systems through uh, lobbying and through the bond markets. It's entrenched in social systems through how we're manipulated by the corporate curation of our mainstream media and our social media. It's entrenched in professional systems through the incentives and disincentives we each are given by our employers and by the job market. In many economically advanced countries, the precursors to massive social change, including our health, face-to-face -face social connection, free time, these are all far less, the data shows, than in decades past. So it's unlikely we're going to see massive social change more today than before, unless, of course, it's because people wake up to how things are breaking down. So I think this means that reform is going to continue to fail and large-scale transformation to avert a collapse is just not, it's just not a sensible, it's not a very uh, robust analysis of the situation. Um, I think it, therefore, is actually going to be a self-serving fairy tale, self-serving for the elites. Um, and so the sooner we wake up and start building something different, the better. I explain in my book that when we recognize our situation, it's possible for our past preoccupations to break down, so we get to choose to live more consciously and creatively. In the book, I argue for a freedom-loving response to the collapse. And that arises from the knowledge that it was the manipulation of our hearts and minds that drove such wholesale destruction. And so liberating our true natures from the systems that have oppressed us has to be part of our response. So a freedom-loving response involves letting go of familiar but failing systems of comfort and security to begin to find mutually beneficial ways of living with all life, including each other. So my view is that unless we talk about collapse, then our suppressed anxieties can be manipulated by those in power who will then make matters worse. Unfortunately, some people get very angry with us for having this view and then try to shame us in order to shut us up and to 
try and get other people to turn away from this topic. You know, when I mentioned COVID earlier, perhaps some of you had a little bit of nervousness about what I might say. And I believe that nervousness is itself an aspect of and an indicator of social breakdown. For we've been subjected to communications that try to make us disgusted at each other for our disagreements. Elites don't want us to agree to disagree agreeably on matters like Ukraine, COVID, the nature and implications of climate science, on gender identity and all sorts of things. There's this encouragement to somehow get angry with each other rather than explore in open dialogue. That's functional. Bringing more shame into public life means we're all going to be more scared about asking questions. Um, it serves to shut us up and divide us. It's why in the Deep Adaptation Forum, since its inception, we focused on helping us avoid that kind of way of thinking and dialoguing and being aware of how our anxieties, are, whether conscious or suppressed, can lead us into sort of aggressive, angry, divisive, uh, ways of thinking, othering people that we disagree with. We did that because we knew that becoming more conscious of collapse means we're becoming more conscious of our mortality. And that can have very different effects on people. Broadly speaking, there are two very opposite responses. Ego affirmation versus <coughs> ego transcendence. So the former, ego transcendence, is where people... Uh, sorry, the former, ego affirmation is where we're frightened so that we double down on our identity and our worldview. Um, and that can become illogical and abusive. And the people who came up with this uh, is in terror management theory, psychologists, uh, and they call it worldview defense. And they did that by actually looking at the rise of religious fundamentalisms. But I think it can actually be used to describe sort of a, a technological optimist fundamentalism where you kind of escape the pain of this by just saying, oh, well, humans will fix it with technology. It's at that level of sort of fanatical faith rather than actually applying scientific method to analyze what may or may not be possible with technology. Um, and it's why, therefore, that people can be, who have that sort of eco-modern outlook become, can become so illogical and aggressive <coughs> with people who don't worship technology in the way they do and say heretical things like I do. It's about the ego being under threat. But thankfully, awareness of mortality can do the opposite than that. And that's been my experience with so many people. It can, through a period of despair, dismay and despair, we can drop our old story of self, our old sense of what made us feel OK in the world, and we can emerge from that more curious, kind, courageous, and creative, more present to each other and ourselves and our emotions. Um, I do like the American spiritual teacher Ram Dass, and I listen to a lot of his lectures nowadays. Um, and uh, I, one of my friends was taught by him, and I, I find him a, a, great, a great guide for me. Ram Dass said we should keep death on our shoulder and identify with our soul. What he's getting at is allowing a deeper sense of the finite nature of life to affect us day to day so that we prioritize discovering our truth and living our values. And that does really help explain the journey of so many people I've met over the last five years. So it's pointing to a kind of almost sacred pessimism, not a nihilistic, apathetic, numbing or defeatist pessimism, but actually a fuller acceptance that the difficulties and setbacks and sufferings of life are just as much part of life as the things that we like. So basically, it's bringing us more into full acceptance of life. So in my own journey, I found Buddhist philosophy and practice to be of great help. And what I also like is it can really complement other religious traditions rather than displace them. It helps us live with the personal destabilization that occurs when we lose our sense of certainty, security, status, and meaning. I think the Tibetan Buddhist teacher Chogyam Trungpa 
summed it up nicely when he said, the bad news is you're falling through the air, nothing to hang on to, no parachute. The good news is there's no ground. <laughs> that is highly relevant as we face societal collapse. As we don't know how far humanity will fall, we don't know how far we ourselves will fall, or how far we might actually even be freed through that process. Therefore, I know there's useful work to be done in helping each other process our feelings about insecurity and mortality so that more of us will respond with ego transcendence rather than a defensive ego affirmation. There are many ways to help with that, which involve drawing on wisdom teachings, but also through human connection, nature connection, and mindfulness. So this inner work, this inner adaptation, is as important, as Balaj said at the opening, is as important as the external work of community, gardening, uh, skill sharing, uh, such like, and such like. So although it's far better to build garden beds than bunkers as you wake up to collapse, um, without that inner work, we have less chance of responding well when situations become more and more difficult over time. So, it's not just strange me standing here in front of you, um, it's also strange that you're sitting here. Um, we, we're many people today, I'm very impressed, but we're still a tiny minority of people, I guess in Hungary, but absolutely in the world, who are open to this, uh, this conversation. You are letting your intuitive knowing of our predicament guide you in who you want to talk to, what you want to talk about, what you want to do. To allow that intuitive knowing to bring you more into, the, into presence with others, to unleash your courage and creativity. And so actually you're an exciting group of people. So you're, you're strange in a good way. So um, make sure you uh, chat to each other and uh, you could maybe go up to each other and shake hands and say thank you for being so strange in a meaningful way and then see what you end up wanting to do together. So thank you uh, for making this happen, Balaj and the organizing committee. I'm super excited about what the World Adaptation Forum is going to become. Thank you to Hungaro Pessimism for helping Hungary lead the world in deep adaptation. Um, yeah, and thank you for being strange in such a beautiful and meaningful way. Thanks.